This fat man may look like a badly dressed sex offender, but in fact, he's much more than that. This is Dr. Rusty Wigwam, the world's greatest criminal mastermind and inventor of the carrot. I'm Malcolm Gobshat. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I first encountered Dr. Wigwam in 1982 when he blew up my house because my dog farted near his car. Since that day, I have devoted my life to studying this elusive and mysterious man. After a long period of intense negotiations and a massive cash payment, Dr. Wigwam has granted me permission to produce this documentary of his life. Today, he is a multi-billionaire playboy and chairman of Wigwam Industries, the criminal organization that has been implicated in over 85% of the reported crime on planet Earth since 1959. But he hasn't always been rich, powerful, and sexually magnetic. He's always been fat and violent, but he was born into a very poor family. His parents, Rasputin and Esmeralda Wigwam, were opium-addicted burglars who worked as a team. Esmeralda would distract the occupants of the house by pressing her unnaturally large breasts against a window, while Rasputin broke in and stole what he could before the police arrived. They made very little money, and lived in a decrepit hovel in the middle of the forest. Here's the great man himself to tell us more. My parents were moronic, peasant scum, and I hated them. 24th of August, 1934. Esmeralda had to take a short break from pressing her unnaturally large breasts up against windows in order to give birth to their only child. Hello! It was a long, painful and complicated birth because Dr. Rusty was born sideways, with a full beard and sunglasses. This was to be the first indication that the young Dr. Rusty was not like other children. Born to be wild, bad to the bone, baby. Rasputin Wigwam was not happy about having another mouth to feed, and immediately sold the baby to a dog food factory. Luckily for Rusty, his mother managed to steal him back from the factory. But sadly, by then, he had already lost a leg in the mincing machine. It's a sad story with a happy ending. I eventually got a bionic leg and used it to kick my father to death. Dr. Rusty, I am trying to tell the story. Would you please stop jumping in and telling people what's going to happen in the future? Up yours. Returning home with the now one-legged Rusty, Esmeralda tended to his wounds made him a false leg out of an old tin can and hid him in the forest so that Rasputin couldn't sell him back to the dog food factory. I kicked him to death with my bionic leg, 1949. We're not doing 1949 in this episode. Just stay out of it. It's my bloody life story. You agreed to let me make this film. I didn't know you were going to make me look like a one-legged simpleton. I'm just telling people the truth. You hid in the forest. You were raised by wolves. Just concentrate on how great I am. Don't keep telling people about my tin can false leg. It's embarrassing. Sometimes the truth hurts. I'll tell you what hurts. Me bashing your skull in with a rock. That's what hurts. I suggest you skip the bit about me hiding in the forest and my tin can false leg and move on. All right, all right. Where would you like me to move on to? Let's skip the first five years. I lived in the forest, I was raised by wolves, I was occasionally visited by my very stupid mother, bringing me yet another ridiculous false leg, and move straight to 1939, my fifth birthday. 1939, with Europe on the brink of the Second World War. Never mind the history lesson, you buffoon. 24th of August, 1939. By now, Dr. Rusty's false leg was made of wood and actually shaped like a leg. He had left the safety of the wolf pack and made his way to London. And how did I get there? You rode there on the back of a wolf. That's right! That's the kind of details people want to hear. Exciting stuff, like young Dr. Rusty riding to London on the back of a wolf. Okay. Arriving in London on the back of a wolf. Yes, 
The young Dr. Rusty arrived in London without money or food. So I ate the wolf. <laughs> How ingenious is that? Look, you're ruining this. I'm trying to tell the story of your life in the chronological order it actually happened. But you keep jumping in and ruining it. Newsflash, dickhead. It's my life story. I'll do what I like. Right, that's it. You are on your own, fatty. I quit. You can't quit. You're fired, muppet. What are you looking at? <laughs> I'm Dr. Rusty Wigwam, living legend and poster boy for narcissistic personality disorder. I'm terribly sad to say that Malcolm Gottschalk has had a tragic accident with a bullet accidentally blowing a hole in his face. <laughs> so I'll be taking over the presenting duties on this series of autobiographical videos. 1939. Having travelled to London on the back of a wolf, which I then proceeded to eat in order to survive, I knew that I needed to make my fortune. In those days, employment opportunities for five-year-old boys with beards and sunglasses were limited. Chimney sweep, astronaut, marketing consultant, speed skater, none of these really interested me. But luckily, I was approached by a man in Soho. He offered me a shilling a week to dance in his strip club. I eagerly accepted his offer. And it was here, in the Young Boys at Go-Go Club, that I first started to develop a style of dancing that would eventually be imitated by millions. Body popping was born. Sadly, no footage of this time exists, but here's a short recreation of some of the popping and rocking moves I invented. I worked at Young Boys at Go-Go for five years, saving the money that old men put into my thong until I had enough to put the first stage of my master plan into action. What was my master plan? Ha <laughs> ha! You'll have to wait and see. Until next time, my mentally subnormal friends, goodbye! <laughs> Da 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 da